Hi, everybody. We're back. This is Dave Vellante. I'm with Wikibon.org, and my co-host Paul Gillen and I have been going all day today. We're here at MIT at the Information Quality Symposium. Uh, it's a symposium that uh, comprises uh, the root, really, of the event. It was, was the Chief Data Officer uh, uh, Forum that occurred on Tuesday, and a number of information quality practitioners. We're here at the Tang Center at MIT. It's a very intimate event, uh, a lot of one-on-one -on -one conversations, uh, a lot of hanging out, a lot of breakout sessions, keynotes and the like in the auditorium. Uh, and we've been covering it. This is theCUBE. We go out to these events. We extract the signal from the noise. We bring you the best guests. Naeem Hashmi is here. He's the Chief Research Officer uh, for Information Frameworks. He's involved in the uh, MIT Sloan School CIO Symposium, uh, does a lot of CIO activity. Uh, focuses on analytics and big data, which is something that we're going to be talking about. Naeem, welcome to theCUBE. Thanks for coming on. Thank you much for here. Okay, so tell us, uh, you, you have your hands in a lot of pies, so tell That's us right. a little bit about yourself and, 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 and what you do. Right. Basically, I'm a nuclear physicist and health physicist. <laughs> it's, a, it's a weird combination. <laughs> uh, but I uh, have been engaged with a lot in the industries, uh, worked for digital for a long time, and uh, doing a lot of innovative stuff. Uh, always been uh, in the area where how we are going to manage information in the future. So looking forward 10 years, 20 years down the road, build the architectures and reference models, and then work with the vendors as well as the IT organizations, how to roll out that kind of vision. So I'm sort of a vision type of person. So I started this, uh, after leaving digital, I started this uh, business. And uh, a lot of work has been publications. So I wrote about author, co-author four books. I'm working on a fifth book. And this fifth book is really interesting and it talks about uh, informatics and analytics design strategies. The way I see is in the healthcare today, there is a lot of talk about informatics and analytics. But well, if you can define, uh, I don't mean to interrupt you, but define right. informatics, because that's a word that's been around a long time. I'm not Correct. sure many people know what it means. Correct. Uh, it's very misleading. Uh, in fact, if you think of any kind of, kind of analysis in the healthcare business, it was classified as informatic. But it's really not informatics in, in that term. It's a lot to do with how, and if you look up, decipher the informatics word, it's informatics and ICS like analytics, analysis size of something. So anytime you see the informatics, it's informatics about something. So this informatics is, uh, so when I start to write this book, I have to really spend a lot of time doing research. What's the difference between informatics and analytics? So the informatics have some attribute that you are basically discovering the information, you are synthesizing information where in the analytics world, you are analyzing the data. In the informatics world, you're also giving sort of a recommendations and the looking up some kind of pattern, especially in the healthcare world, disease or, or those area applying. When you go back to the typical analytics world, there we're talking about very much of a structured data, you know, qualitative and the predictive kind of modeling in that context. Mm -hmm. So that classifies, plus also it's a lot more of a uh, informatics requires very powerful visualization type of piece because it's a very complex information, how you present that information, especially for the doctor. Uh, in this book, I also talk about how a clinician thinks and how a physician thinks. It's a very different approach. So where informatics really fit in from the physician perspective, where they're looking up some kind of pattern. So sometimes you're presenting the large information, set of information visually, and they can see certain type of trend is appearing. It was not intended to show that, but they could see this trend is going on. Where clinician, him or herself, they will be looking a lot more of the algorithmic. I need to run this uh, uh, ventilator. What steps I have to go through? So it's very much of a thought process is very different. And then comes up the analytics piece, how you optimize the clinical process. How you, if you want to, like in the ACU environment, you, how you do the profitability analysis, how you share the benefits, how you optimize these things, how you... This is, this is, uh, this is very interesting because we've been talking all day about healthcare, yeah. and, and most of the conversation has been focused on 
uh, on electronic health records sure. and gathering the data and simply getting the data into a database. Sure. You're talking about going beyond that to, to right. understand, uh, to, to derive some, some greater meaning out of that data. Right. Uh, how does that affect the quality of care? I mean, mm -hmm. are, what kinds of, of analysis do you believe clinicians will be able to perform uh, as EHR uh, uh, goes mainstream, sure. what, what kinds of, uh, how will it improve their diagnostic capability, their treatments? Mm -hmm. uh, there are several ways. Uh, actually, we're just starting up that area. So it's, a, it's I would call it a ver virgin territory at this point. So a lot ahead of us, we will do a lot of learning. But I'll give you an example. Like uh, just before, uh, till last year, I was uh, working at Fresenius Medical Care. I was their vice president for knowledge management. And uh, when you talk about knowledge management, in this term, in this conference term, is a lot more to do with exactly like what the CDO they're defining. Mm -hmm. So I was responsible for all the data, and the Fresenius is the world's largest dialysis company. So we treat about 60,000 patients daily, and there are about uh, 2,000 clinics throughout America, and about 1,500, 1,600 individual EMR. So when, and the patient moves from clinic to clinic. So how you make sure when the per person comes to a clinic A, like salesperson is today is getting treatment in Boston, tomorrow they're in New York, how the information has traveled. So we have, we build the architecture, that's I'll talk in the afternoon, use the big data platform to move all of this information from these clinical systems into this central hub, and then analytics like the, the dose adjustment perspective. So we can see the latest result of the person and also look at a longitudinal way and build those analytics that how the dose should be adjusted. So when the clinician or physician comes up to give the treatment, they have the latest information and the recommendation because at night we run the algorithm. So when the patient gets the treatment, so they get the right input that this is the recommended value, but up to the physician to really override or not because that's the decision, that's a regulatory thing. I cannot really automatically change the dosage. You know, someone have to sign. So what medications I administer, they will go back. So this is just one example. The, uh, I could see, you know, the usage of Watson. Watson as a service. Yeah, I was just gonna say. Right. Uh, that, that's, uh, it's yeah. a dif differential diagnosis because not every IT organization or the healthcare organization will have the capability or the resources to build that kind of uh, knowledge service or the diagnostic service where they are looking up information from all mm. the publication, published material, getting up all the from the practice information and uh, doing very intense, that will be part of the, I will call again informatics, not analytics, but a lot more do informatics. They are synthesizing the lot of information, giving some recommendation to the uh, uh, decision maker, in this case physician, and they will decide, you know, what benefits or not, which treatment is good or not. So I think those kind of things will start to emerge more and, and more. And, and are you f you're familiar with the Kaggle content, yeah. right? The right, crowdsource. Right. So where would sure. you put that kind of activity? Do you know about this, Paul? No. So Kaggle is essentially is they crowdsource they mm. crowdsource healthcare data, right. and they have a contest. I think the winner actually right. is lucrative, a million dollars to the True. winner, to develop, you know, do predictive analytics and right. develop algorithms on. You know which class of patients sure. are you know going to be most susceptible. Exactly. Right. Uh, uh, I think uh, uh, last year I was also one of the judge for Massachusetts Health Data Palooza, so there were 21 really innovators. They were presenting it, and the winner was one of the young lady from uh, Harvard, a young uh, entrepreneur, started the firm, and what she was doing was looking at. Uh, she took her own depression scenario and convert it into the innovation. What there was, she mentioned that because of, you know, take, she taking the birth control, it was affecting their, uh, it was causing the depression. So she uh, started a firm, take up all the medications data, and look, scan through all the social networks, see how people they're describing the depression, especially in the women, and then map out what kind of medication, birth control, will be better for them. So to me, these kind of things are really coming around. The, the major challenge comes up is, once you are getting this information from disparate systems, especially the healthcare, how you really make sure the proper context and the content is done properly. Mm -hmm. Healthcare is such a, you know, very specialty oriented. So term are very specific 
to one, uh, uh, what they call uh, uh, practice, it's the same term on the other one, but have very different meaning. So those kind of things, you know, uh, it, it will require a very much of a semantic and mm, what they call ontology mm -hmm. properly, especially in the healthcare perspective. So I think those things will be coming more and more. And I see in the future, actually in 2003, I published one of the cover story in Intelligent Enterprise Magazine, and that was on the BI on sales, business intelligence on sales. And uh, that was the same thing, you know, in the future when you're going on, it will be a lot more to do with few powerful services are available, and you subscribe to this part of the clinical process. So the clinical processes themselves have to be more of a customizable. Today's vendors, I don't think their systems are really flexible enough, because to me, their systems are nothing more than changing their paper form to electronic form. I call it forming without re reforming. Mm -hmm. So not understanding how they when you automate these things or electronize these things. Great point. So how you make those things together. Because essentially they're taking the same business process Correct. and they're putting it, pushing it to electronics. Now of course that business process was developed Correct. for paper. Oh right. Uh, <laughs> and, 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 and it was developed because paper is so inflexible. Correct. So they're taking that process and say, okay, yeah. let's make this electronic. Exactly. It's not really only the process level. Mm -hmm. uh, also the content, the paper, exactly the same form electronically, and now in paper form, you can write and write, there's no validation. It's like when TV came along, right? All the, exactly. all the radio guys said, why would anybody want to watch a bunch of guys doing radio? That's right. true, that's <laughs> true. Uh, so I think, an, uh, in my experience, when I was at Fresenius, we learned that too, you know, when we were implementing the EHRs, uh, uh, the uh, mi migrating thousands of to the, new, uh, the newer system, and it was inflexible, a lot of data quality issues were coming up, because there's no validation and verification on those fields, because those fields were originally designed from the form, and you do the same form up there, and since there is no control there, you know, what based on the rule, if certain value comes up, what should be the next one, or valid one. So how, how should we think, uh, I mean, thinking of us as, as patients, how mm -hmm. should we think differently about how our uh, health information should be used in the future. Mm -hmm. As we get out of, as Dave mentioned, you know, that is kind of paving the cow path sure. approach right now where you're, you're just taking data and putting it into a different form. Right. What you're talking about is it's going to be used differently. And right. what should we expect as, right. as patients? I think, uh, uh, to me, uh, there's a big responsibility on the patient. And to me, it's healthcare itself is a, such a fragmented industry. Peers are fragmented. Providers are fragmented, and patients have their own ego. So once nobody's trying to work together, so there will be always that kind of issue comes up. To me, I think patients also have to be open because there is, I think there's a concern for privacy, but there's a too much concern for privacy. Once that comes up, then this information sharing becomes an issue. Once information sharing becomes an issue, you can't have a longitudinal view of the information. So. I think some of the healthcare reforms that are coming up, they're going in the right direction. We need to learn a lot through that. I think there's a intent, intent is really right because such sometimes when you do the meaningful use ones, you know, going to the EHR giving incentive, that's a move, good move, but it's still at the early stage to change the culture. Because again, it's not really only the treatment. Physicians are taught differently. Nurses are taught differently. And they always, they have to live, because it's a regulated industry, they have to live within their mold. Well, and it is cultural. It, I mean, it, look it look is. at the backlash from prism. I mean, exactly. you got, this, is, this, is, this is a manifestation of the, the country's opinion right now, but exactly. you got one side and the other True. side, with people defending it, people attacking it. Right. And so privacy is, is one of those touchy things. We had right. Scott McNeely on theCUBE recently, well, mm -hmm. about a year ago now, there's no privacy, just get over it, which True. is kind of what you're right. saying. Exactly. Maybe not that much. True. <laughs> in fact, uh, uh, I went to this uh, HIMSS uh, conference in uh, New Orleans. Right. In, uh, I, I was mentored and also do the, their award and uh, also the uh, BI and the informatics track. Uh, when you enter in their hall, uh, what they call exhibit hall, there were about thousands of vendors, 1,000 plus vendors, and you can smell in the room when you open the door, smell of analytics. <laughs> and everyone, and actually 90% of those analytics are not analytics. I wrote one paper at Search Health IT. I call them arithmetics, not even analytics. Analytics means- What do you call them, sir? Arithmetics. Ah, okay. It's arithmetics. analytics yeah. or arithmetics. Yeah. And 
you know, the CMS meaning was used, you know, the major yeah. CQRS and all the way. Yeah. When you think of, it's nothing more, it's, the, it's not intelligent, it's not analytics. It's to do with what's the numerator and what's the denominator, mm -hmm. give me the ratio. So it's simply arithmetic. Uh, I couldn't agree more, right. It's, just, it's uh, so basic arithmetic, right? It's a basic arithmetic. And we're going to make it pretty. Right. <laughs> not even pretty, just give the number. <laughs> not even and uh, everybody, every vendor is going on the bench <laughs> of what they call a bandwagon weird analytics. Yeah. So that's why I started, uh, so I wrote this series of those articles. Analytics about. washing. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I call it the uh, <laughs> snake oil, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, actually they are moving more towards future, especially with the like Watson kind of things. Uh, in, in the book I also talk about, uh, you know, how the uh, translation informatics comes, uh, translation informatics is basically coming from the bioinformatics and medical informatics and all the therapies and things after trial gets into the practice. Now when you go to the practice, because these trials and the effectivity was basically on a c controlled trial basis, but not in a practical, when the patient comes, look at a lot of economic factors, a lot of disparities comes along, how a patient behavior come into play. That time the actual, what the translational research came from the lab it's implemented into clinical practice, it doesn't really give the same results outcome than really what it is. Mm. That's what last year uh, healthcare uh, and uh, administration people, they have launched CER, Comparative Effective Research Project, meaning that look up how different clinical practices they do the outcome. And that's become the, uh, also dealing with the social data, taking the feed from there and refining why a certain type of therapy really worked or not with this kind of community, with this area, with these kind of physicians, with these kind of mm. comorbid conditions. While the bioinformatic pure science was saying this, but actually is this. So how you marry those together, and that's where you know some kind of Watson type of area, the technologies. And I, I know I have talked with a few people, vendors, they're starting up that area. But on top of it, the other area which is my interest these days is called Psyche Mining. Psyche Mining? Psyche Mining. Okay, what's and that? I, I, I published that in 2004. And that Psyche Mining is, you know, how people think, why they think, what influences them, and especially in a cyberspace perspective, different part of the world, people think differently. The concept of reward is differently. The concept, concept of uh, respect is differently. So how you develop uh, distributed autonomous agent technology that becomes like a virus and attaches to the mobile and on and on, on both end of the communication or the end, end of the communication and also senses, like if I'm making a gesture, because now there's all the mobile devices, there's sophisticated cameras and everything. So you're doing the gesture mining as well you're seeing the object as you're creating some emotion, that brain waves kind of thing. And uh, uh, actually I have four PhD students, they were doing some research, I was advising them, I found Center for Knowledge Engineering. <laughs> <laughs> it's an interesting concept, but I see that a lot into, especially when you're moving more towards the behavioral and mental health, that will be really key. And uh, right now I'm, I'm working with uh, six Harvard professors, uh, they're launching a company called iHope and that will be the behavior and uh, health uh, uh, therapy perspective. Right. So developing those kind of technologies. Do you know, do you know Jeff Hammerbarker? No. Jeff Hammerbarker is the f one of the, f uh, well he used to work at Facebook, he's one of the founders of Cloud. Oh yeah, sure, sure, sure. Mm -hmm. So he, yeah. he has a famous statement in the big data world, mm -hmm. he says the best minds in my generation are trying to get, figure out how to get people to click on ads. Sure, sure. He's also uh, a doctor and he's now mm -hmm. at Mount Sinai and he's trying mm -hmm. to apply his knowledge sure. elsewhere. But I wonder, yeah. uh, are things like clicking on ads, do they right. fit into that psyche mining with right. maybe turning into you know, behavioral economics? Yeah, or, right? it, it I mean is there. Actually yeah. in 2006, uh, no 2005, I advised one of the, uh, uh, talked to one of the company. You know, uh, they are the one of the largest uh, 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 pay, for, pay for perform, you know, the pay for click, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So how many times you click. So how you identify, how you, uh, Defraud. Like if I, I'm a market, uh, I'm broadcasting in the uh, or um, advertisement, and every click will consume my one cent. So the competitor, they will have some robots, you know, clicking onto. Yeah, but Google can find those robots, right? Right. So, <laughs> but the thing is now, how you identify those, 
And yeah, also yeah, right. so algorithmically, how do you mm -hmm. exactly separate so those? Not things. only that, plus also how you do the imp make the impressions. What time if you're selling a BMW uh, and or you're buying a car or buying a BMW, your decision making process is different. So based on the context, how you really engage them, so behavioral marketing to the contextual marketing, right. switching back and forth. So we, a lot of people talk about real time, and the right. way we define real time on, yeah. on the cube is uh, typically is before you lose the customer. Correct. Maybe you would define it before you lose the patient. Exactly. <laughs> you know, so, all right, right. Naeem Wilson, we're out of time. <laughs> great. It's a great you. conversation. Really appreciate Thank you coming onto the cube. Appreciate and it. it was a pleasure meeting you. My pleasure. All right, Thank keep you. it right Thank there, everybody. Paul Gillen and I will be back. We're live from the MIT Information Quality Symposium. This is the cube. Thank you.